going to move right into the Q and A after just a few words, and we'll move right into the Q and A. Okay. Well, here I am again. <laughs>
and it kind of equates a percentage point in standard deviation, the way that line is drawn, with a percentage point in future returns. You take one percentage point more risk, you get one percentage point more return. Well, I always argue, in a kind of a nasty way, uh, what sense does that make when an extra percentage point of return is priceless and an extra percentage point of standard deviation is meaningless? Think about that. You're, you're comparing the meaningless with the priceless. So be a little skeptical of all these things, even though Gus, intellectually honest, the, the University of Chicago Vision Frontier model, uh, probably is, comes out about the same place I do with the future. So we'll just have to see what happens. Uh, I want to I mention one other thing about Gus talked a little bit about threats to Vanguard, and he used complacency. And I have a different kind of threat, which is best exemplified. And this, this is not to do with innovation in the firm. And you know, all those wonderful people you saw last night, you know, I saw a group that I didn't even know existed at Vanguard, helping to educate children at the grade school, the high school, and the college level. It's a fabulous idea. Lovely young, young ladies. Don't make me bow. And uh, so, so happy to meet so many crew members that I hadn't met before. These are not the big shots. Uh, these are the people who are doing the hard work and keeping this place going every day. When you talk about, I think one of our big risks is a different kind of innovation, and that's trying to innovate in the funds we offer. And I think that is a very bad idea. Uh, how, how can you? bring out a new fund that you think will do better than the index. Uh, why would it do that? How could it do that? It can't do that. It can come and go. It creates still an additional risk. So I'm reminded, one of my favorite stories, as Mike Nolan knows, about the fabled shredded wheat basket, uh, biscuit. And uh, there was an ad in the New York Times three or four years ago, and all it has in the middle of the page is a shredded wheat biscuit. This bit, whatever the right size is for a full page at the time. And it says, this is the same biscuit we've made for 100 years. It has the same ingredients. It's made with the same care. It's made with the same machinery. And it tastes exactly the same and bites exactly the same. We put the no back in innovation. <laughs> <laughs> and when it comes to, I think our risk is over innovating. And that probably sounds to anybody who's progressive as a typical statement by an aging veteran who thinks there's only one way to do things. But since I am an aging veteran, and I do think there's only one way to do things, <laughs> <laughs> what can I say? I think that's probably enough, uh, Mel, to, to open the, 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 uh, the session. And uh, we'll turn it over to you, if you can give me a couple of minutes at the end. OK, we'll do that, Jack. Uh, I know you'd like to uh, uh, respond to questions from people who are attending. So, when I call your name out, just raise your hand so Jack knows who he's speaking to. This is from, this question is from Dion. And he asks, when Vanguard was developed as a mutual company, you thought other companies would follow. They haven't. Do you think they will? Well, I'm not sure I really thought other companies would follow. I didn't see how they could follow. And I don't think they will follow. Because this is a business it is basically turned from a professionally managed, as it was when I came in, very small business, uh, where, as I said yesterday, uh, we, we uh, sold what we made into this great marketing endeavor where we make what we sell, and it's gotten bigger and largely because of public ownership, conglomerate ownership, so many mutual fund management companies, about 80% of them, it's become an entrepreneur's dream to start a mutual fund company and get rich. And when you look at what's going on in the ETF world, exchange traded fund world, we have a lot of entrepreneurs out there. They're in it simply to capture the next moment. They're in it to make money for themselves rather than compliance. They're what Henry Kaufman called, I think, I think I used this yesterday, financial buccaneers. That's not good for the investor. It's great for the entrepreneur. And they'll all make a lot of money, but their shareholders will not. So if you're making a lot of money and losing the performance all the time to the index, you really can't change. Uh, if, if someone were to try and get their costs down, I might have mentioned this briefly yesterday, get their costs down to Vanguard's expense ratio, which I think is a weighted number of about 15 basis points. We'll take someone like Fidelity or T. Rowe Price or even uh, Dodge and Cox, which is a little bit lower. They're running at about 70 basis points on the weighted expense ratio. And if they
they destroyed the firm, eliminated marketing, fired the portfolio manager, started indexing, uh, took away a little bit of Ned Johnson's 26 billion. <laughs> <laughs> it's a living. <laughs> they could probably get their costs down from, say, 70 basis points weighted to, let me say, 40. And what's the point of that? They're still three times what our expense ratio is. They're not competitive, and they've given up all the purchases and stuff that they have, and they're their old way of doing things. So it's going to be very hard, and to visualize it even a little more clearly, there must be an innovator out there, not in the industry, saying, well, I've looked at this industry, and there's only one way to go. It is the Vanguard way. So I'm going to start a mutual company. Now, I want to go out and raise capital to get into the business. It's going to take, let me pull a number out of the air, $200 million to bust into the mutual fund business. But how am I going to get that capital? Because when someone gives me $200 million, they're going to want a 15% minimum return on that capital. So somehow they've got to make $30 million a year. There's no way you can do that. What a selling. I got this new IPO, this wonderful innovation, but it's not going to, not going to produce any money for you at all. Invest now. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know at what point competitive pressure drives people into trying to protect their market share and their cash flow when they're making money now. And I think the honest answer to that is the people in this business see that. Uh, they, they see that the future prospects for significant earnings growth are gradually diminishing. But they're sitting on a great cash cow. So this cash cow will generate money to the managers, money to the conglomerates, money to the public shareholders. and. Uh, but they will be diminishing, and a lot of the companies that are now owned by conglomerates or, or cell phone fidelity, for example, I would guess would be sold to some kind of a financial firm within, say, five years. That's a pretty short period. I hate to make five-year predictions, because it's the least possible I'll be alive to see whether they came in. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I don't you know, you can see what's happening, and it's dramatic. You saw those charts mm -hmm. yesterday. You're doing 140 percent of the industry's cash flow, but other people aren't going to concede because they're still making a lot of money. They're happy. There's enough money to keep everybody rich. Uh, the capital group people, private company. I think on every every ranch in Montana. Uh, well, maybe not quite every one. I'm giving a little hyperbole here, but uh, it, it's going to be. If it changes, it's going to be a very very slow change. Well, Jack. Uh, uh did you get a, any degree of satisfaction when Fidelity tried to respond to Vanguard's index funds when they bought the Vanguard, I mean, the Spartan funds out? You know you were responsible for that. <laughs> yeah, well, the Spartan funds are a, a, a pretty good, first of all, to be clear on the Spartan funds, they are the only, Fidelity is the only fund uh, group, only fund sponsor in the entire industry that's taken indexing seriously. They probably have, is it, 50 billion, 400 billion? About 150 or so. 150 billion indexing. I mean, it's just a drop in the bucket. But nobody else is anywhere near that. And uh, they charge kind of Vanguard type prices. Every once in a while they try and undercut, doesn't seem to do them any good. And then they go back to, you know, trying to make a little penny here and there in their index fund. But uh, T. Rowe Price has an index business. They won't even tell you about it. Well, maybe they will. I call them on the phone. <laughs> Charging 23 basis points. 23 basis points for an S&P 500 fund. You know, I think those directors have breached their fiduciary duty to that fund, and uh, it just it doesn't work. Uh, I think it's um, Morgan Stanley is even worse. There's a J.P. Morgan that charges 100 basis points, but they only charge 50 basis points if you pay a 5% sales commission. <laughs> <laughs> only, by the way, I don't know how that works. Flipped out. <laughs> so uh, it's, uh, it, it's pretty much monopoly, except uh, for the BlackRock, uh, which is doing quite well, and State Street, which is just kind of hanging in there. And they have the most widely traded stock in the world, and that's Spider. Uh, but uh, it, it's not going to be a very profitable business for them. And they're, they're pretty marginal in terms of cash flow. So it's basically come down to BlackRock and Vanguard. And uh, we're 25% of the ETF business. 
75% of the traditional index fund business, and BlackRock is probably 5% um, of the traditional fund business, index fund business, and uh, they're bigger than we are, so they're probably 35% of, uh, of the ETF business. So we'll be bigger than BlackRock. I don't know whether that will give me any satisfaction or not is another question. Uh, you know, there are, there are ways to use our ETFs that are satisfactory and, and important and uh, valuable to investors. But there seems to me to be a lot more ways to use them in a very foolish way. Not so much at Vanguard, but when you've got, we talked about this yesterday, you get this triple leverage, and then you get somebody like Wisdom Tree that had a decent idea at the beginning, and it's now basically 100% of their cash flow is in and Japanese uh, and, and, and European and index funds which you can trade to your heart's content. And uh, they're making a lot of money, but investors are all going to lose with that strategy because nothing is good forever. So, I, you know, it's, it's probably a little dumb to say I don't see any real major competitor on the, on the uh, horizon, but the, the, it's the mathematics that I always come back to. And you've got to look at the incentives, you've got to look at the motivation. And no matter what they do, and I think this is an important point, they can do anything they want to compete with us. If you want to lose money, you can make bring in that index fund at four or five basis points. Uh, but the real, the, what we really have going for us is having had missionary zeal for indexing, basically not from day one. That was just an idea to get us into the investment management business back in 1975. But from, say, 1980, 1985 on, in the 90s, this zeal of perpetuating the value of indexing. Books, academic articles, the kind of things I've been doing. How can somebody that's been dragged kicking and screaming into the index business compete with someone who has this missionary zeal as if it's the holy writ? <laughs> it's just not a fair trade. So I, I, we will sustain uh, our position, I'm quite sure, unless we over innovate. And that, that would have such a small at the beginning, a very small impact on what we do at Vanguard. It certainly doesn't require anybody who's in the indexing to go somewhere else, and I would not recommend that. Nothing will be better, in my opinion. Jack, here's another follow-up question uh, from Dion. In your wildest dreams, did you ever think Vanguard would reach $3 trillion? No. <laughs> <laughs> but I did, uh, I think back in about 1989, you could see touch the growth in our firm that was not going to slow down. So in 1989, or it was not going to slow down very much, we've been growing at a 24% rate, annual rate. That means your, your assets double every three years. And we were doubling every three years. In fact. And uh, so I, I, I gave a speech to the crew and to our internal staff previously called the tyranny of compounding. You know, we always talk about the miracle of I was trying to point out there's a lot of tyranny to it. So I said, look, if we continue to grow through the 90s uh, at, say, an 18% rate or a 15% rate, because 24% is not sustainable, we're going to be a trillion dollar company in, I, mean, I, 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 I guess I said 800 billion in uh, 1999, and I would have gotten to this trillion a couple of years later. I probably should have repeated that exercise in uh, 2000. But it would have come out the same way. Our growth rate now is not 24%, and it is not 18%, and not 15%. Our cash flow growth rate is 5%, 5.5%. That's what cash flow does. You get a lot of inflation and growth when you have very good markets, and then you get a lot of deflation and growth when you have bad markets. So the way to look at a firm's growth rate is cash flow as a percentage of assets. And that's a very healthy growth rate. You know, our GDP is growing at maybe 3% a year. Um, so if you can grow at 6, 5, five or 6, uh, you're going to do just fine. And, and of course, the dollars get so big, because <coughs> you're dealing at 6% of, of a 3 trillion, that's 180 billion. And that's not too far from a little bit higher. I think our, our cash flow for this year is projected to be maybe 165 billion. There's a question about the bond duration, and it says, do you think shorter duration bond funds, two to three years, would be a better choice, or stay with intermediates, and heavier on corporate bonds? 
yes and yes. Maybe I ought to amplify that. Um, shorter duration is not a good bet, period. Because in the long run, the bond yield is determined by the coupon, and the long bond, long bonds the yield probably a percentage point and a quarter, something like that, more than intermediate term, and two percentage points more than short term, maybe even three. Uh, so you will do better in the long bond. I just have been around so long that I can't look at the numbers in the abstract without saying how will people react if interest rates go to 4% and that long-term bond drops by 40% value, which is roughly what would happen, very roughly. And you, I think most people cannot handle that. So no matter how good the long run is, we all have a little, we're influenced by the short run. You know, the long run, God knows how long it is. Um, and uh, if you have a retirement plan, you know, then gee, I better uh, do something about this. I can't handle those losses. So it's the psychosomatic or behavioral effect that worries me. So what I do myself is do, um, well, in my personal account, a limited term uni and intermediate term uni, about half and half. So it gets me to a duration of probably maybe four years, something like that. And that sound right, Mike? About four years. He's a good man. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you say exactly four? <laughs> and uh, on my corporate, I have some uh, mostly short term. We don't have limited term on the corporate side and the index side. Uh, and, the, uh, and, and I'm a little down, on the, as I told you yesterday, on the, on the total bond market, because I just think it has too much in the way of governments. Too much in some abstract way. Can I prove that? No, I cannot prove it. And uh, my big booster, David Swenson from Yale, thinks the only bond you should know is low owner government bonds, treasury bonds. And uh, I think in the real world, that's just not enough return. And the, the, the amount of risk, I'm talking real risk and not standard deviation, is quite small. And uh, you will do uh, significantly uh, worse than a treasury bond if you have corporates. But they have a little default rate. Maybe the corporate return will be less than the coupon, but not enough to get it down to the treasury rate. These are all expectations born of too many years of experience, perhaps. <laughs> so uh, I'd say yes, stay short duration. Don't overemphasize governments. It troubles me that treasuries and, and, and mortgage backs, um, treasury backed mortgage backs, are 70% uh, odd of the bond index. And uh, I just think that's. Too much, and I've tried to get Vanguard to change it, but you can imagine what they think when they get a letter from me saying, you know, we're doing the bond thing wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and I started it that way. I didn't have anybody to advise me. I'm not sure I looked it up at the returns, but the returns were so high, and the yields were so high when I started that bond index fund, first bond index fund in 1986, it just seemed like a no-brainer. Uh, the yields were so high, the rents being up, let me say, 7 and 8 percent, just didn't look so stark. When you get to 2 and 3%, that's a 50% difference. So, uh, are you looking? <laughs> I think it's Lord Keynes who said, he said you know, you, that's not what you said the last time you talked to us. And uh, Lord Keynes responded, when the facts change, I change my mind. <laughs> what do you do? <laughs>
And I think you touched on this, but uh, the question is uh, from Karen Bennett. If you care to share it, what is your personal asset allocation and why? Okay. Uh, and believe it or not, I just, I just actually changed it uh, for the first time in many, many years. Uh, let me go back a little bit in time with you to an interview I had with Don Phillips on Morningstar in, uh, I think, the spring of 2000.
know, look, look what the data looks like. And I trust my judgment, but I'd like to see data and uh, on a whole variety of things that are so far-fetched you wouldn't even believe it. Uh, I had one, one of them to give you an idea of where my mind is working. I, I met with some Australians uh, and when coming out of the galley, and I was going to meet the head Australian, chief investment officer of ANZ, the next morning. So these fellows were, were sitting with a Vanguard rep, and, and it happened to be a nice day. They were outside, and the, the outside portion of our outside of our galley is uh, almost totally shaded. But all the way over, coming back on the right side, there was this bright sun coming through. And uh, so uh, I had a nice chat with these guys, and I said, I don't know what you're doing sitting in the sun like this. I mean, it's the only you can get burned up or something. And then I said, you know, it reminds me of that quote from Shakespeare, I'm too much E the sun. As soon as I got back to the office, I said, Mike, check that one out for me. See how right I was. <laughs> <laughs> Mike failed me. <laughs> so that night I did it myself. Google, I'm too much E the sun. It's Hamlet, Act 1, Scene 3, and contains, which I never knew until I looked on the Google, not just too much in the sun, Hamlet being, feeling he was too much in the spotlight after his father was murdered, uh, but also his uncle had murdered the father, you know, you know the story, and so it was a pun on I'm too much in the sun, S-O-N, from this guy. So I learned, it, learned a little bit, Mike learned a little bit, and when the Brit came in, I mean, the, as the Aussie came in the next morning, I let him have all barrels. <laughs> So, is this useful? Is this productive? No, this is crazy. <laughs> it's, a sign, it's a sign of a mind and for men, perpetually. And uh, so, I don't have a simple answer to these questions. Uh, things pop me out. I was sitting into an, an investment company, I'll give you another more, more correlate example. Uh, many years ago, probably 20, I was sitting in, in the uh, audience at the Investment Company Institute general membership meeting, a little bored, and uh, I started thinking, and I thought, you know, we have a short-term municipal bond fund, an intermediate term, but the short term is really too short. So I write down, <laughs> limited term uni. Next day, I'm in the office, gather my little staff around, probably four people, and say we're going to start a limited term municipal bond fund. That's how the process worked. And, uh, you know, it seems crazy, it seems stupid, it seems arrogant. Uh, I mean, and I rarely did I consult with anybody, as I've told you in a couple of other contexts. But it all seemed to work out well. And it says something, uh, I think, and I'm not sure about any of this, but something about the individual compared to the consensus. I wanted to start an insured municipal bond fund. Uh, so my friend Jeremy Duffield said, we're going to do a survey and see if anybody wanted one. Nobody wanted an insured municipal bond fund. I said, we're going to start an insured municipal bond fund. You know, a lot of trouble out, out in the Pacific Coast, Washington State Power Authority went bankrupt. And I thought it would just be a good idea in the abstract. So we started it. It's been a big success. So I, one of the great things about a very small company run by a dictator, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry, that's really the way it was. something to be said for that if you're trying to do something that no one has done before. Uh, when you get big, it's much more difficult to do. You go through a process, process, process. Judgment, as I mentioned, takes a back seat. So um, I guess it's just, and it, I, I'm not sure it's healthy, by the way. Uh, at least some of my thought process involves things other than investing. Uh, I'm not sure enough. And uh, at least I try and keep spending a good amount of time with my family in mind. I'm not sure I do a great job on that, but I do an adequate one. And uh, I think everybody understands. So it's um, idea generation is much more impulsive and much less processed than anybody can imagine. And you know, you tell this to a consultant who's, who's going to tell you some damn thing like, pardon the, pardon the expression, uh, if you can measure it, you can manage it. Of all the idiotic comments ever made, I mean, 
is it all about measuring things? I mean, really? <laughs> what about people? How do you measure character? How do you measure integrity? How do you measure loyalty? Oh, we have some test that measures it, they say. I don't believe any of those measures. And uh, so I'm, I'm afraid I'm showing you reluctantly, well, not so reluctantly, my very worst side. <laughs> Jack, uh, uh, the number one topic that uh, we had on the forum, questions for you, and I looked from the members here and from the uh, forum members, was about your thoughts and views on international investing, <laughs> which you talked about yesterday. But an interesting question on that uh, was from this seat. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, stay the course. It says, if you were born on the same day in Japan and grew up as Jack Shinkahara, for example, <laughs> but you still have the same fervor for home country bias and equity investing as you do as Jack Bogle, born and raised in America. Oh. <laughs> and that's so easy to answer. Uh, Japan is not America. <laughs> America has the most diversified economy in the world, the greatest innovation, the greatest uh, entrepreneurship, the greatest productivity, the greatest technology base, the greatest protections for shareholders, and ownership of private property of any company in the world, and that last one I will make a possible exception of Great Britain and Switzerland. These things are vital. These things underlie America. None of them underlie Japan. I mean, they're barely getting out of the imperial age over there. They have a, they have a terrible demographics, as, as, as Gus mentioned this morning. Uh, they have a very structured economy where you go up in these little chairs and sing the company song. Oh my God. <laughs> I'm fertilizing you, but I'm actually having a good time. This next question is from Brian. He says there have been recent studies that uh, propose starting retirement withdrawals at a lower stock bond uh, mix and later raising the stock bond mix after you have avoided the stock market volatility risk in the initial phase of retirement. What do you think about this proposal? versus a more traditional, get more conservative as you age approach to the mix of the time the stock market mix. Well, to begin with, I think it's appropriate to challenge the age-based kind of formula. And to be clear, I have never said this is some kind of geometrical thing that you do automatically. I say it's a good place to begin. Think about your age, think about your bond position equaling your age. Why? Because the yield up bonds Income yield, on, the interest rate on bonds is higher than dividend yield in bonds and stocks. So as you get older, you want more protection and you want more income. So that kind of logic permeates the idea, and that's that's a decent logic as far as it goes. But the fact is, we know so little. Uh, in, Rob Arnott, not exactly my dearest friend in the business, um, who runs uh, not the F A R, RAP A R. RAFI, Research Associates, uh, RAFI, uh, and then does the uh, smart beta kind of thing with, with his fundamental indexing thing, which has not proved itself at all yet, but he's only had 10 years. Uh, <laughs> I, I did not have to say that. <coughs> but uh, I don't think there are easy answers. And I do think, and I struggle a lot, of, a lot with this now intellectually, I do think there's a difference when I started talking about that, and bond yields were maybe 7% and stock yield for maybe two, not the extremes of the year 2000. I do think we have to think to ourselves that the idea is to get more income by having bonds when you're older. And the dividend yield on stocks is 2.1%. And the best you can do on a reasonable, high quality bond portfolio is maybe two and three quarters or three percent. I think we have to challenge our assumption with that there's not a lot that's permanent in this field. I don't know how, I don't have the answer to that. I don't have to be able to change the way we do our target date funds, but I'm a little suspicious and I wonder if those uh, life strategy funds, just pick one and have it permanently, uh, permanent ratio is not a bad idea. And then I would add this, what do we know about uh, rebalancing, so a little related to that. And uh, we know that it is an unwise thing to do for a long-term investor, because when you rebalance, you're selling the higher returning asset, usually common stocks, and buying the lower long-term return asset bonds. So the more you rebalance, the less well you do. 
compared to just hanging on to the stocks and keeping a, bit, a higher and higher position on the stock and, uh, and, and uh, just leaving the bonds back in, in the, to the lower return as a smaller and smaller portion of the portfolio. That's not a, like a mantra for me. But it is something that we all want to think about. Uh, and, uh, and times change, conditions change, interest rates change. So the, the, basically the answer is there is no answer. Uh, but, I, but I do think that the target date approach is a reasonable approach. I think it should be compared to the life strategy approach, which is a permanently conservative growth income objective, series of objectives. Probably, I don't even know, but 30% equities, 50% equities, 70% equities, or something like that, maybe even a little higher, uh, is, is another way to do it. There, there's no guarantee in any of this. There is a behavioral element, comfort level, if you will, uh, that if, you're, if you get older, and you know, I know this feeling. Uh, I didn't even talk about this when I talked about the difference between what you need an older age income, for example, and lower risk. But there's also this human factor. You know, we get a little bit crotchety and nervous when we get old. I don't, but everybody else does. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jackie, just on the uh, uh, life strategy funds and the target date funds, do you have any idea when an investor looks, let's say retired looks, and they, they're looking, thinking, and being conservative and income, the life strategy income fund is 40% equity. The life strategy target, uh, the target date retire, uh, income fund is 30% equity. Do you have any idea why uh, Vanguard has the same income in uh, portfolios that are 10% uh, more in equity? No. I started those funds. I didn't know that. Uh, you know, there is, in, in all my bragging about the number of things that are on my mind, uh, you know, everything is not on my mind. And I, I'd actually be very surprised at that. So I'm going to ask Mike to check that out for me, okay? Or do you know it's true? I'm not sure. That's the first time he's ever answered that. Uh, <laughs> I know the life strategy. So we'll, we'll check it out. It seems very funny. Is it 10%? You know, think a 10 percentage point difference, and you multiply it the expected stock return and expected really doesn't change uh, your risk or your return very much if you have 10% more or less. So I think sometimes we're too damn mathematical, too darn mathematical. And uh, it, it's basically, what are you comfortable with? What do the numbers tell you to do? How much do you think your risk, style, how much money do you have at stake? You know, if someone has a huge amount of money at stake, it's going to be very different. If someone's struggling for every penny, so they don't have to call on their kids when they, when they retire when they get 10 years into retirement. So none of this is easy. And that's why anything that is too formulaic kind of worries me. And yet, okay, Bogle, gross return minus cost equals net return. That sounds kind of formulaic to me. So I guess what I'm saying is anyone that uses my formula is okay, but anyone that uses other people's formula probably ought to be careful. <laughs> I, I am trying to make, by the way, a serious point there. And that is not everything can be converted to numbers. Read my book called Don't Count On. Jack, I may have misquoted those numbers. I think I was comparing the life strategy conservative versus the target date retirement income. So, well, see, that would depend on which target, which, which retirement. Right. The target retirement income fund is the final fund that everything eventually goes to. But you'd be picking a particular target date retirement date right. uh, to get that 30%. I don't know what that no, is. No, but all funds in, end up in the target retirement income fund, which is the 30%. So a target retirement doesn't have an income fund as such. Uh, it's just a gradual scaling of the equity ratio. Yeah, but they, I think they call it the target retirement income fund. Well, they should stop that. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, check, we'll check those out. I don't know if they will move on now, because I'm pulling from memory as I used to. A uh, question from Nisi. What do you make of predictions that investment returns going forward will be lower than we're used to? I think we all know your answer. Do you think that they will uh, be lower than normal for a long period, or for? Well, let me say a couple of things about that, and that is when you look at things in ten-year aggregates. And let me let me use one kind of my simple number, which is the six percent future return, just for the fun of it on stock. Start with the knowledge certain that it's not going to be six, 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 six. It's going to be plus twenty and minus 40, and it's going to jump all over the place. So uh, that in itself is, uh, you know, kind of gives a lie to thinking about things as a, as a time continuity. Uh, the, the reality is that 
this could all be, and Gus kind of hinted at this, I think, or maybe even came close to hinting at it. You know, we got a good solid 40% market decline, and all would be well. And if you think about it for a minute, I, mean, I don't think too many of you here are in this category, and certainly I'm not. But if you're building a fund for retirement, pray for a 40% market decline. Not just Sunday, but Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Because you'll be investing at lower prices for years. So it, we have this kind of funny bias that uh, you know, market highs are rising markets are good and falling markets are bad. And the fact of the matter is that everybody must know that the rising markets are good for sellers and bad for buyers, and falling markets are good for buyers and bad for sellers. There's this eternal equation, and nobody can challenge that any more than they can challenge the gross return. Just so you get the full point minus cost equals net return. Jack, you said uh, the first two words you said uh, uh, in your opening remarks the other night were Taylor Claremore. Uh, I have a message for you from Taylor. It says, Dear Jack, no one in the mutual fund industry has a greater combination of character, uh, practical experience, knowledge, inventive genius, wisdom, perseverance, management ability, literary ability, kindness, modesty, and a desire to help others. What are your most important words of wisdom to give to your audience? Well, first of all, my wife would agree with all that. <laughs> <laughs> she said, who is he talking about? <laughs> as always, my wife is right. <laughs> we will be spending, celebrating our 60th wedding anniversary next September. And uh, so I don't want to do anything to disturb her. I don't argue about that. <laughs> but... Uh, the advice really is simple. Look at investment principles. Know what the game is about. Understand where we're to the sources of returns, one of my big themes for both for bonds and stock. And just try and figure out how much risk you can tolerate. You know, it's easy to put in a questionnaire, what would you do if the market went down 50%? And uh, people say, I guess it wouldn't bother me at all. Well, that's a barefaced lie. You know, it's easy to contemplate. 50% decline and say, fine, I know it's going to come back. Then it goes down 50%, you're on your way out the door. Uh, so it's, it's behavior, it's who you are, and always be who you are. Life is too short to be anybody else. And, uh, but take into account the fundamentals. You know, listen to what people like me are telling you that are reasonably unbiased about future market returns. And uh, conservative, I would always lean to the conservative because you will then be in the awful position of oversaving, which is so much better than being in a position of undersaving when that great retirement date comes. And then I would add, and I'll, I'll throw in a little anecdote here, uh, that uh, I, I, I had this expression, uh, don't peek, don't peek, P-E-E-K, at your 401k envelope when it comes in, or your IRA envelope when it comes in every month and you're adding to it. Just throw the darn thing in the wastebasket. And to keep doing that until you retire. And when you retire, open the envelope. But be sure and have a cardiologist. Because <laughs> <laughs> you're going to have a heart problem. And you won't believe what you've accumulated. And the, the anecdote part of this, and every once in a while you, you find out, yes, in spite of the odds, somebody is actually reading this stuff. And somebody is getting the point. And I've been saying that for a long time. And I got a letter from an airline pod was just retired. Not so long ago, a long letter. And with a couple of long follow-ups. And his first letter began, Dear Mr. Bogle, I have just opened the envelope. <laughs> <laughs> it gave me such gratification. <laughs> you know, it's ESP because the next question was from Backpacker. And it says, you've said that investors shouldn't peek at their portfolio statements. I believe your exact words were, don't peek, don't peek, don't peek. This helps them stay the course, and when they look at their portfolios right, up, right before retirement, they'll be floored at how much they save. How does that work in practice, though? Don't investors need to monitor their, their portfolio to rebalance, maintain age and bonds, and watch for fraud? Well, you got to distinguish between the real world and the hypothetical world. I mean, you know, read the tortoise and the hare. It's a great story, and no better story for an investor. But it's overdrawn, it's hyperbolic. Uh, you know, none of us are tortoises or hares. 
it's just a question of how much of us is the tortoise and how much of it is the hare. You, know, you read these things about all people are divided into two classes. Are you kidding me? <laughs> I'm looking out at 220 people or something here, and not one of them. I mean, this group is divided into 220 different classes. <laughs> and uh, so you have to recognize people's individuality, and you have to recognize uh, the difference. And I'm not sure I'm good at this, by the way. The difference between kind of a little hyperbole to make a point and hoping that people understand it's like an ideal or a fable or a moral uh, that you adjust around to deal with who you are yourself. And that scene is uh, a little bit like one of my commencement speeches um, in one of my books, I guess it's in, uh, in um, Don't Count On, uh, This Above All That I Own Self Be True. Then thou canst not be false to any man. Shakespeare probably would have said man over man or woman. Uh, and uh, that's also from Hamlet for those who care. And uh, so the idea that there's some answer, you know, young people, crew members will often come to see me and say, I'd, I'd love to come and meet you. And I do my best to accommodate them. And they basically, if I can simplify the conversation, say, okay, what's the secret? <laughs> What's the secret? And how do you get to be the head of a three trillion dollar company or whatever we were when I last ran it? And uh, I say, look, you have a lot of assets that I do not have, and I have a lot of liabilities that you do not have. We're different people. Every person's secret is different. So just learn what you can. Watch others. Watch what they do. See what you can identify. Do what you can. But for God's sake. Be true to yourself. And uh, so, I, you know, I don't have you know, this kind of Confucian sort of wisdom. Uh, but I do have a certain kind of wisdom that calls for perspective. And uh, maybe I have to use the word modesty. <laughs> but I'll say modesty in the extremity of my views, not, not, not a human being. And uh, so we all, you know, we all struggle on different family circumstances. I mean, they're so different. Everything is so different. When someone says, you know, I can tell you what the rule is, the rule is there is no rule. I mean, there's common sense, uh, there's mathematics, um, there's what stage of life you're at, um, it, it, it's family, uh, what your objectives are to, you know, leave money to your children or make enough money for yourself to have a comfortable retirement. <coughs> abstract goals, uh, but ultimately are measured with a dollar sign, a certain number of different things to it. So I don't, you know, I'd love to have some really, do we have a wise sentence, Mike? Could you give a wise <laughs> sentence that I've given you? <laughs> Stay the course. Stay the course, that's good. There's so many you can help it. Up. Press on regardless. All right, this next one's from uh, Jane. It says, Vanguard has publicly maintained that uh, HFT high-frequency craters are needed as market makers. Given that Fidelity and other large fund companies are starting their own dark pool, why is the Vanguard joining them to potentially get the best price for the customer? Is there a disadvantage in placing trades within the internal dark pool first before going to external exchange? <coughs> well, that's actually, particularly in this day, in day and age, kind of out of my, out of my pay grade. You know, I don't know exactly how we do it. The idea that we are doing other than best execution and maximum shares volume and at a given price, or close to a given price, is I think eternal, and that has to be the rule for a firm like Vanguard. And the extent to which we use dark pools, I imagine we use them, but I don't know. And uh, you know how you even define a dark pool is a little bit funny itself. So I just have to beg off. It's the first question I've been asked in two days, but I really have to beg off the answer. Uh, this is an interesting question. It's uh, uh, not investing related. But I've always wondered why Mr. Bowe decided to keep Vanguard headquarters in Malibu, PA, as opposed to moving to one of the money center cities. Well, the, the answer to that is pretty easy. Uh, and I'll give you a little anecdote to go with this, too, which very few people know. Uh, and that is, for a whole lot of reasons, including Philadelphia taxes. We were in Philadelphia at Wellington from 1928 uh, to 1974. And the kind of early in 74, we decided we could get better real estate prices, uh, better workforce, um, eliminating Philadelphia wage.
wage tax, and therefore being able to recruit a better workforce, uh, just, just on a financial basis. And so we moved out to, well, what do we call it then? Right around the corner from, from the Chesterfield building we had, and a uh, small building. And then when the company blew up, it was sold. <coughs> Uh, with, the, with the wonderful young people that we recruit 
here, and I think it helps in that way, workforce way. <coughs> I'm not even sure of that. In fact, this next thing is not a question, it's more a nice comment uh, from Miriam. And I want to pass this along. It says, I just received my beautiful hardcover 2015 edition of John Bogle on Investing, the first 50 years from Wally Publishing. Part of his de dedication states, and especially with the photo heads of the internet, dedicated and loyal cadre of Vanguard Dialogue to give me strength to carry on my mission. It's incredible to think that we, the foreign members, give him the strength to carry on his mission. Perhaps we could thank him for his dedication. It is nice to know how important the Bogo Heads have been to him. And it really is, Jack. That, that dedication was very nice.
humanity in the picture. Uh, you know, I'm doing my best every day to do it. Uh, I may not be here forever, although sometimes I entertain the contrary side of that proposition. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jack has to leave, but before he leaves, he wants to say a few words. So, 